So, Ryan Block, welcome to the journey. Uh, I appreciate you being here, I, and you'll get into it maybe here in a second. But I know you've had a, a, a pretty rough weekend uh, coming into this with a lot of <laughs> a lot of traveling. So, but let me first start off with uh, a little bit about what the journey is, and sure. and the journey is just an opportunity to have to capture conversation for some ordinary individuals who um, have either had some setbacks in their life or maybe they've uh, had opportunity to go through a transformational process right. and, um, and and especially with your background the the you the the use of the arts as mm -hmm. well as athletics and how they can be used as maybe a metaphor or a platform in which um, for that transformation to happen and resiliency to happen um, but just in general we have to move out of those elements into real life and how do we apply those principles so uh, so essentially that's what uh, the journey is about Right. So, uh, Ryan, thank you for uh, being here this morning. And Thanks for having me here. Sorry we had to reschedule this, oh, no. but uh, life happens, yes, as we all know. Yeah. And was it the flu? Is that what you had last I week? I think it was like a 24-hour flu, yeah. Okay. It was, I felt awful. I actually slept most of the day last Monday because, yeah, it was just, yeah. Which is weird for me because I don't ever sleep. Well, obviously, you needed to do that to recuperate, right? Yes, especially for what then happened later, the latter half of that last week. But yeah. sure, sure. So uh, before we jump too far into your story, uh, I always like to ask, uh, what do you do for fun? When you have an opportunity to have maybe either some downtime or uh, time to enjoy some things, what 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 is that? What do you what do you do to enjoy enjoy life? Uh, that that's such a multifaceted question. Um, I've really gotten into traveling. Okay. But when that's not financially feasible, um, running. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So uh, tell us about tell us about running. What's a long distance running? I'm assuming. Um, just like re regular routine, few miles a day type of a thing. Okay. But okay. I've done. 95 miles since June. Okay. All right. And so, and, and when you go out for a run, what's the, what's usually, is it two miles, three miles at a time, or sometimes? It started it, out as two, and it, now it's gotten to be between, like, close to four. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. And where do you, where do you, if you have an, an ideal place to run, where do you run? Outside. Outside. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Not one of those weird treadmill people. Okay. So <laughs> I need, I need, I need energy and ambiance and that's not you can't really get that in a treadmill sure sure okay all right now have you always been a runner or is this something no in fact i get a horrible shin splint so i don't even know why i do it i yeah. just enjoy being <laughs> out okay all right okay and uh and so so historically that that's not been one of the mm -hmm. things that you've done but as of late it's something that you've been enjoying right okay well good good yeah. and then i know that you also went through and you lost some weight and yeah and about 30 pounds. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And did that coincide with the running as well? That was a part of it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So not only enjoy the actual process of the act of running and what that does for you, but then also helps with the results too. Correct. Nice. Okay. So, so Ryan, you uh, graduated from Harlem, right? I did. Yeah. And, um, and that obviously that's where I graduated as well. And so we have some mutual friends uh, during that, <laughs> in that place. You graduated, what year did you graduate? Uh, 2002. 2002. Okay. All right. So that was a, a couple years. Years after, uh, just a couple, <laughs> couple years after us. <laughs> My gray is better at hiding, unfortunately. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, we're not hiding much anymore. <laughs> right. So, uh, um, so t tell us. Uh, you now, do you have siblings? Do you. I do. I have. Uh, <laughs> that's a fun story. Okay. I have one full, uh, one full brother. I've got one half brother, and then I've got two uh, step brothers. Okay. And so your full brother is older or younger? Younger. Younger. Okay. So you're the. Are you the oldest of the of the group? Or? I am. Second Second oldest out of all of them. My one of my stepbrothers is older than me. Okay, yeah. gotcha. So uh, mom and dad obviously were together when yep. you were younger, and then they split. Yep. And how old were you when they split? Thirteen. Thirteen. Okay. All right. And and how 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 old is your younger brother? Uh, he is just turned thirty three. Okay. Okay. I believe. If you see this, Jared, don't hate me if I got it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um. But yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So, uh, what was it like growing up at, at Harlem? What was that, uh, and, or what was growing up like? 
That's always a fun story. Um, I was a nerd. Okay. Put it this way, all of this yeah, didn't yeah, happen yeah. overnight. You know? Yeah. Um, but no, it was. I was. I was the one that was bullied a lot, and. Um, That's, I mean, obviously, I mean, that, that, that's the background of a lot of people's story mm -hmm. is in some way, shape or form, they were bullied or they were the, the bully themselves. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that was, I mean, I, I was, I was the quintessential nerdy kid okay. growing up. So. Okay. And so did that, was that in grade school or, were you, or was that? Until in, about sophomore year of high school. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that's a, that's a pretty good length of time. Right. And was it, was it both verbal and physical or was it more one than the other or? Um, a little bit of both. Okay. And, and I'm guessing these were the, the, the stereotypical kids you grew up with and. Mm. In, in that piece of it, okay. Yeah. And so when you, when you refer to yourself as, as a nerd, what like I have I have imagery in my mind of, of that you were into computers or you're into like what what does nerd mean? I mean, I, I I was always the art kid. I was so oh, I mean. Not necessarily a reader, but I always had a book or was always going after learning something. Okay. And I was an artist, so I mean, painting, sculpture, anything I can get my hands on. Uh, I tried music, uh, started at piano, thanks to my grandma at an early age. Unfortunately, didn't stick with it. I'm kind of regretting that decision now. Um, but no, it was anything that I could do to kind of distract myself. <laughs> okay. So when, yeah, tell me, tell us a story about the art. How did, uh, how did you get involved with art and what's, uh, I mean, I was always drawing or coloring as a kid and that okay. just transformed into inevitably painting and then sculpture and then whatever I wanted it to be. Okay. Did you have someone at, uh, when you were in grade school, middle school notice that you may have some talent toward it or this was something that you kind of pushed yourself into? More my pushing myself towards it. Okay, and at, at, at what at, at what point did someone go, "Hey, Ryan, you're pretty good at this"? Um, I mean, I'm sure there were several moments. Unfortunately, I don't remember much of my childhood. Okay, it was one of those weird things where my when my parents split, and the subsequent research that I've done after that knowing that at that age when it happened there there was kind of one of two ways that i could go mm -hmm. one way was obviously remembering everything mm -hmm. or the other way was and this is the one that happened to me was remembering absolutely nothing mm -hmm. and so a lot of the memories that i have of childhood and growing up or fortunately or unfortunately i don't know are secondhand stories okay. they're uh stories that other people experienced and that involved me and that were subsequently shared with me gotcha okay um so so mom and dad because it's there's a lot of times there's a couple different stories that go with mm -hmm. when parents split right it's all the things that lead up to the split and then the process of the split and then the right. afterwards right and yep. and um anything that you recall regarding that because there's a lot of people that have some sometimes it's done well but if it's done so well then usually people stay together <laughs> right I, I can say it wasn't done well uh, but that's not my story to tell yeah yeah, yeah so yeah. Um, and obviously it's well in the past now as that happened yeah. when I was 13 and I'm now 35 yeah so that was a long time ago yeah yeah so but. So as you went through high school and, and went through that process, art continued to be part of it, mm. right? And music was too. And music, yeah. Tell us a little bit about the music piece that was part of it. I always, I mean, I grew up listening to music. So, okay. I mean, my, between parents and grandparents singing in church choirs and anywhere and my grandmother playing piano and my grandfather playing the organ. And so, I mean, music was always there. Okay. Um, and then I found punk rock. Okay. All right. And then I'm like, my people. Because, <laughs> I mean, it was all the outcasts, right? Sure, yeah. Anybody that didn't look or fit into the mold. And I'm like, oh, these are my people. And I okay. discovered that at about 16. Okay. And um, started working with a few bands between, like, 17 and 19. Uh, kind of managing, for lack of a better term, these basement punk bands that really never left the basement. Played in a couple of them. 
I'm so glad that that recorded music does not exist anymore. Um, <laughs> if you wanted to call what I did at the time music. Yeah. But, uh, no, and then... I mean, music was always a constant. Okay. Uh, even growing up, I was the kid that was always looking at the liner notes and trying to, wanting to, or not trying to, wanting to learn more, not necessarily about the artist, but about how the artist went about their craft and uh, who the people were that were behind them. Okay. And then I found an old Elvis record one day and I started find, uh, learning about Sun Records and everything that was like, and I'm like, this is, this is what I want to do. Okay. Um, and then, of course, we had to grow up, right? We, sure. We had, sure. We had to, uh, oh, man, the music industry doesn't make any money. Like, you, know, shit, you can't do this. Sorry. I don't know. That's okay. Can, That's fine. <laughs> you know, explicit label tag. I don't necessarily know if I could. Yeah, you can. But, uh, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> but, no, it's, uh, so, yeah, then I let it die for a long time. Okay. And, uh would you get involved with why you thought well, I can't make any money at the real real life nonsense jobs? Uh, <laughs> give, me, give me a couple um, examples. Telemarketing okay. to and I'm keep peeking his microphone down there. Mm -hmm. uh, telemarketing to fast food to sales to anything and everything. Okay. Door to door meat sales at one point in time. Uh, yeah, yeah, that must have been entertaining. Yeah, when you, the first shotgun pull, you're like, eh, probably should <laughs> rethink my life choices. Then the second one came out, and you're like, I'm done. Uh, but so, so going back to the your the first exposure to this, as you said, my people, right? So, right. so bring me back to that time period. What what bands were playing at that time period? They they caught your that really caught your caught your interest. I mean, I'm gonna all the Rockford natives who've been around a while should know these guys. Okay. I mean, everybody knows Carly's Day Out, right? Like mm -hmm. the I mean, we're at least from local music. Mm -hmm. um, PJ and everybody over there was always ones that were that caught my attention, and um, but that led into bands like Anti Flag and Bad Brains and. Just digging into the different cultural references or cultural connections on East Coast, West Coast, DC, because all these areas had their own punk sound. Okay. Right. And uh, that led into ska music. And, and it just was more or less these were amazing sounds that mm -hmm. were created in not even standard tempos and off beats and, and almost intentionally bad. When you look at traditional sound and song structure, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't know, I just loved it. And they were just, I guess, being an angsty teenager, they were playing angsty music. So sure, sure. It was fitting yeah. in that space. So it made sense. It was this alternative, right, right, to what you were experiencing growing up or had been growing right. up, right? And and now there for lack of better words, you had a place or had a voice or had at least a direction of okay, here here's where I can right. I can kind of fit in or have have Attempt some identity. to assimilate into, yeah. Have some identity here. Yeah. Okay. And so um and so then you did these these different uh, adulting-like jobs, right? And, adulting. And um, so, you, so you do these jobs, but obviously the, the music and art are still what you're interested Always in. Always there. Yeah. Always there. And so when, tell us a little bit about that, at, at that you start making, you start moving in that direction, because that's what you do now, right? Is, is Part of it, yeah. So yeah, or, or maybe actually you could jump in and tell us, what what are you doing right now? What is, what is it that you do right now? This is when I say I, I, I do a lot. Um, although, after what I have experienced this past weekend, a lot of it's going to change. Um, I've never fully taken the leap into doing 100% of what I've wanted to do. Okay. I Because, I mean, we have responsibilities, right? Yeah. We're, we're adults, and that comes with managing necessities of life and not fully always diving into doing what lights our fire most mm -hmm. and uh, but eight years ago I founded an organization called what well, it was called at that point in time independent ear productions and uh, it was started because 
Hmm. The backstory on that first. We, uh, at the time, I was working as an investment advisor. Okay. You know, fancy suit and tie. Sure, like, yeah. No, no forearm tattoos. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Whew. <laughs> and uh, they, there was a partner of mine at the at the firm, and he, uh, the whitest white collar guy ever, could rap against anybody and win. And I'll, I even give him credit to this day. I'm like, I'll put you toe to toe with anybody in the game, past, present, or future, and you'll win. Sure. And then he'll look at me and say, "Stop." <laughs> um, but no, he were coming back from a meeting with a client one afternoon, and he pulls over. He's like, "I want to show you this new music I'm working on." I'm like, "I've loved everything else you've shared with me. Why wouldn't I like this too?" And then he starts playing this beat through the car stereo, and he's got his lyrics on a pad, and. Uh, and, some, and then he just started spitting the verses over the beats, and something inside of me just clicked. And I looked at him, and after a brief pause and probably a second of awkwardness, I said, I don't know what I need to do to become a part of whatever it is that you're doing, but I'm going to find out, figure it out. And then I walk into his office a week or so later because he was one of those really cool kids that had an office, and I was just one of the cubicle guys, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, and I said, I figured it out. I said, I'm going to start a record label. And then we both laughed, right? Because the thought of starting a record label in Rockford, Illinois, with no money and no real music industry experience to speak of, was a situation deserving of a laugh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, at least mm -hmm. in my eyes. And, and I said, I, I don't know anything. I just know these two things. The music industry is flawed. It's broken. And that relationships have the power to change the world. So if I figured I could create world-changing relationships, maybe, just maybe, I might be able to create an impact in a broken industry. And... Um, and when you, and just real quick, when you said that the industry was broken, re reference what you meant, what you meant at that time, because that was eight years ago, and it's still broken today. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the music business, a lot of what happens behind the scenes, or not so much behind the scenes anymore now, thanks to social media, but um, are very favoring towards the business and not to the artist, right? So a record label would approach an artist 20 years ago, say, hey, here's half a million dollars. Go make us a record. And I mean, anybody who really wants the inside scoop on this, watch a film called Architect. Uh, it was created by the band 30 Seconds to Mars, which is Jared Leto's band. Uh, that will give you the full depth of it. Okay. We don't have time to get into all sure, that. Sure. But uh, long story short, uh, a record label approaches a band. They give a band money to go produce a record, to promote a record, to live. And then the record label can say, eh, I don't like that record. It's not going anywhere. But we still own the rights to it. So an artist spent all of this time creating this, this, this piece of art and then subsequently gets shelved or gets sidestepped because it doesn't sound the way it's supposed to sound or they don't look the way that the industry wants them to look or the record takes 24 months to record and maybe in month one it was what the industry wanted but in month 24 it's not what they want anymore. Mm -hmm. And then the industry controls it and then the artists just sit. Mm -hmm. And I see this all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, let's be real, the 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 artists that we see every day are are make up maybe five to ten percent of the industry as a whole. Sure, right. Right. It's 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 very much of the one percent is getting what the ninety nine percent don't. Mm -hmm. um, and for me music has always been or musicians have always been the most powerful beings on the planet. Is, yeah, keep going. Yeah, they are the only beings on the planet that can create something that is so <clears throat> powerful. Because what they have the ability to do is something that ninety-five percent of the world can't, won't, or is too fucking afraid to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
because who else do you know that will stand on a stage and just bare their soul mm -hmm. and do it every day? That's powerful. Not only that, but music is the only art form in existence that can cause time travel. Mm -hmm. And any, any author, any painter, anybody else can argue me on that point, but they will lose. Mm -hmm. So when you say, to give us an example. What you, uh, All right, so Kevin, you're, you're a little bit older than me, so this reference is gonna work. Okay. These other two young guns in the room yeah. probably aren't gonna know <laughs> what this means. But we all remember that moment when we're like 16, 17, that awkward teenager phase, mm -hmm. and we're in the car with the girl that we have a crush on, mm -hmm. right? And our palms start getting sweaty, our heart starts going ta -ta 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 ta 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 We start losing the ability to speak coherent sentences. And then that one song comes on that gives us the courage in that moment to say, I like you, or to take it a step further than that if the event so chose. And then you, then the moment's over, right? And you go on with your life, you grow up, you, you, you live, and then 10 years later, 15 years later, all of a sudden you, don't, you haven't heard that song in a decade and a half, and you hear that song. And no matter where you are in that moment when you hear that song, on a metaphysical level, your body goes back to that time when you first heard it because of the moment attached to it, mm -hmm. right? So your palms start to get sweaty again. Your heart starts going, dum -dum, dum -dum, dum -dum. and then your voice cracks. You're like, the hell? How the hell did that happen? I haven't done that in 20 years. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Huh. All of a sudden, everything just comes flooding back. Mm -hmm. That's what music does. You know, I, I, I have a, a real life um, example of that. September of 1979. Okay. Um, I'm in grade school, right? And it happens to be, and this is this goes way back, right? So, so the only ra only music I had access to at that time, access to regular music, was uh, WLS out of Chicago, mm -hmm. right? And so it's September of 1979. I don't remember the date. Um, and it's Saturday night, and this happens to be the night that my grandma mother my mom's mom dies and and I had I'd only experienced one other family death before, and that was two years prior to that and so I'm at my house at that time and people the pastors coming over different people are coming over and 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 so they want the kids because now it's after eight o'clock or whatever my brother's already asleep I go into my bedroom and I'm listening to the radio right mm -hmm. and I don't know how many times it played but probably once an hour because that's probably that the Eagles released there's going to be a heartbreak tonight mm -hmm. over and, and over, over and, and over and over until about five years ago anytime that song would come on I would turn it off or I'd go into another room so I wouldn't hear it five years ago or so I'm at the gym why is that song playing at a gym is beyond me <laughs> But I had nowhere to go. I couldn't escape. You couldn't run away. I couldn't run away. Well, I could, but it would look different. Um, right. And so, so what I noticed is all those things that you just talked about were happening. I had avoided all those years. The other part was I didn't die, and I didn't implode or explode or any of those things, right. and I got through the song. Um, but I had all those emotions that came up. Mm -hmm. But the thing that was different this time is that I didn't avoid it. And so it, it was exa everything that you said, but I had also create a second pattern of my response to that song right. and not wanting to feel those feelings and I avoided. Um, and, and I use that example, the one that I do, because I've been, oftentimes we're having this conversation yeah. in a lighthearted mentality, yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's like ever, all, all the guys in the room go, uh-huh, I know exactly what yeah. that's like. Yeah. But, that's but a great, on a serious note, too, yeah. like that that happens as well. Yeah. And that's a great example of, of, okay, so that makes sense to me, where that, that it, it invites you into 
into and it's and it goes into the memory <clears throat> part of our mind and and it's an experience right? right that's you know that's what art does or that's specifically what music does is it 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 not only creates a story but it, it at a very much a cellular level it it invites you into a, a, a bigger experience right hence why they use soundtracks in movies and and right I had a like I that. had a colleague I think a mutual friend and colleague of ours argue me that that film does it and I'm like show me any movie that has no music or a soundtrack to it and, and see if it still has impact well the irony is even in the silent films there was music right so so yes right. I, 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 I understand your point so uh, so you get into your, so eight years ago mm-hmm. you you come up with this idea right and, and amidst a very tumultuous time in my life then yeah and about doing a record label mm-hmm. but also the fact that there was a, a plan right is that in a grand maybe it's still a pretty broad plan but you knew that the industry was broken in the in the element for the artist right and and limiting how many people could hear their music unless it was on a local level or, or whatever right. and then this other part of about how to move forward a solution but through relationships right so that's what I'm hearing you say was the origin of this mm-hmm. and so tell us a little bit about what, what you've done with it now eight years later <sighs> so much um... No, the, the, I've had the absolute honor of working with many amazing musicians from not only the Rockford area, but across the globe. And um, it's, ha- it's a f- given me the ability to, to travel, to experience new culture, to impart my experience inside of this industry to more um, to, to focus on creating a larger, more involved community, um, focused around providing sustainable culture to musicians and art and artists as a whole. And um, I mean, don't get me wrong; it's still it's still a work in progress. It's still a lot of time of blood, sweat, and tears, and mm-hmm. wondering how. Okay, oh, how are we going to pay this bill this month? Mm-hmm. Because all of this has been done over the last eight years without an investor, mm-hmm. without an outside source to, to, to create sustainability other than whatever income I can manage to negotiate away from my life to support it. And um, a lot of mistakes, so many mistakes. And um, But now all, all of those mistakes, all of those moments where it's been my dime on whatever I can scrounge together to to claim self-funded and um, puts me into a unique spot now because now I know what I can do. Mm-hmm. Now I know what my artists are capable of. Now I know what we as an organization have the ability to deliver. And now I can sit at the table with anybody and say, hey, I've done all of this without you. Mm-hmm made all of these mistakes, created all of this opportunity. I mean, an artist with 10 consecutive top 100 charting records on iTunes, artists that have played across the country, across the world, to artists who have um, been on Billboard and so on. So, like, we've done some real work. And we've done that all without them. Mm-hmm. So now I can say, if you think I've done all of this without you, give me a little bit of something and watch what I do next. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Almost from a point of position of ego, because I know exactly what I have the power to do. Sure. And all I need is the opportunity to do it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, I mean, it led me to traveling to New Orleans this past weekend and being invited to to speak at a conference. What I thought I was only going to—I didn't even know what to expect. What was the conference? Uh, it was a conference called the Cutting Edge Conference, um, and the way that it happened was just all by, I don't want to say happenstance, but I'm a big believer in everything happens for a reason. Sure. And, um, but no, I had gotten a voicemail, and my, if anybody else is like me, you're, you are rarely ever check your voicemail anymore until you get that one random person that is actually going to text you and say, hey, moron, your voicemail is full. And I ch- happened to check my voicemail one afternoon, and um, 
I got this voicemail from a guy who will have forever impacted my world. Uh, his name is Eric Cager. He runs this event, has been doing this conference for the last 27 years in New Orleans. And he's like, well, you're one of your bands that applied to, to perform at this show. We need to know if they're going to be there. Like, so I call my band. I'm like, you all didn't tell me anything about this. Like, tell me more. They're like, well, yeah, we can't do it anyways. I'm like, so I called Eric back. I'm like, well, it doesn't appear that they have the ability to do it, but do you need a speaker? Because I'm like, by this point in time, I Googled everything there is to Google about this guy mm -hmm. and this event and what they're trying to do. And um, he's like, sure. And then we just created a kinship. It was just, we were, it was like, we were, we were part of the same tribe. Okay. And um, so on a complete whim, I said, sure, I'll come down. He's like, sure, I'll, I'll let you speak. But in those moments, in those brief interactions that were led up to the event, it was he saw something in me and I saw something in him that was like, okay, this is, this occurred for a reason the way that it did. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to bring another one of my artists from here in Chicago with me. And um, I did four panels in three days. Okay. You're a speaker. You know how exhausting that yeah, is. Very much so. And... Um, made life changing connections down there and not only now am I feel like I'm I almost feel like that's my second home okay I've done a lot of traveling and have claimed a lot of cities as like second tertiary homes and stuff like that but this is this area is definitely a place where I'm going to build a lot so, so now I'm I'm assuming, but it could be different. Now, each one of those times that you presented to the, on the panels were was it a similar type of topic, or were it different topics each time? I mean, it was all music industry yeah. topics, but I mean, everything from uh, an A and R panel on how we select and work with talent, and I was sitting at the table with absolute legends. Mm -hmm. In a lot of these environments, like John Tovar, who was one of the managers that broke uh, Marilyn Manson, okay. and I mean he's worked with just just gods mm -hmm. of, of rock music and metal and stuff along those lines too. Um, some amazing artist managers that have done really incredible work. Um, I felt like the new kid at the table a lot. Sure. Yeah. So the first panel was a little bit like, okay, I'm intimidated, but I'm still going to stand my ground. Sure. And I made I mean I made that decision because I'm constantly battling between being an introvert and an extrovert mm -hmm. all at the same time, mm -hmm. and um, I said, all right, I could sit here and just just let John Tovar talk, or I could say, hey, pay attention to me, mm -hmm. and and start steering the conversation in a way that was not, okay, this is a bragging moment to, okay, how are we going to actually help the people in this room? Mm -hmm. um, and then I did a, the second panel was on the subject of music licensing for uh, television, film, and advertisement, which is something that I've wanted to break more into for my artists because, I mean, it's how artists make money nowadays. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've struggled in that space. Um, and then uh, the third panel was on um, artist management and how to basically step into creating a business as an artist. And then last, but certainly not least, was the most awkward, induced panel I was on the whole weekend, but it was the best one. Um, there's a style of music in New Orleans called Bounce. Okay. Eric sends me a text message. He's like, a few weeks, several weeks ago, he was like, what are your thoughts on doing this or joining us for this panel on Bounce? I'm like, Googling a Bounce with music over here. I'm like, the hell is Bounce? Because I didn't know. And neither do I, so tell us. What's, so, what's so, bounce? so Bounce is a style of music really specific to New Orleans. And if, you're, if you've ever caught or watched an NFL game with the Saints... I, in fact, will encourage all of you who listen to this to watch a Saints game at some point in time this coming season, and then you'll learn bounce. But it's the style of music that was started in New Orleans um, 
pretty. I don't want to say it's not. It, it's just culture. Okay. It, it, it's the New Orleans. It's and I met the three basic legends behind the one, the the community that cultivated it, and they put me on a panel to discuss. Okay, well, how do we take this to the next level? I'm like, y'all are already in the NFL. You've already taken it to that next level. How are you doing it to create and break out for you, not necessarily other artists? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I don't know. It's, it's basically, if we all know twerking. Okay. It was twerking before twerking was twerking. Okay, gotcha. Okay. But it, it, it's just their their culture. It's something specific to New Orleans. But I mean, specific to New Orleans in a way, but also relevant in other areas like Miami and DC and stuff like that. So I mean, there's it it has connection to these other markets, but is it it's a New Orleans sound. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, yeah. Well, it's interesting when you were just, you know, um, speaking and doing trainings and workshops and different things. Part of what, when I get asked to do that, I spend, I mean, I know what the topic is, um, and I know the general population, but I spend time as I'm preparing for that trying to picture who's going to be in the audience. Of course, not specifically knowing. Right. But meditating, praying, meditating on what is it that they're going to need. You know, if I'm doing a talk for an hour, whatever it is, what is it that they need to hear? Right. And and when you were talking about this idea of not only the relationships in in a broken industry and then this opportunity that comes up for you to go down and be on these different panelists, uh, on these panels, right, Right. with these different panelists who have already are known within within the industry. Um, and then, and then being mindful enough, um, not only wanting you know to be able to be heard too, right. but more importantly, and more importantly, what are we offering the people who pay to come here? Right. What are we helping them with? Because if you can deliver that, then it's then it's worth the trip. Right. And and I had people coming up to me after even the first panel when I when I didn't think it was like my strongest performance. <laughs> performance for lack of a better word um come up to me and they were like what you said was what i needed to hear and i mean i for a long time did not know my own power right because you you have those people that'll tell you i mean we're in the fitness space too right so like you have people like you shake somebody's hand that you haven't shook for the first time right and they're like wow you need to let go a little bit like you're stronger than you think you are Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. type of a thing right I still struggle with thinking or understanding my power Mm -hmm. and knowing that what I say others need to pay attention to. And I mean, I think a lot of us in the entrepreneurial space struggle with that, especially if you've battled depression and anxiety and and various mental conditions um, for as long as you, as long as I have in this particular case, you, you doubt yourself a lot. Mm -hmm. And I've spent a lot of time doubting myself. Yeah. And when people, when people were coming up to me, I mean, even some of these legends that I was sitting at the table with Mm -hmm. were coming up to me and saying, we need to talk like, what you said was was meaningful, was powerful, and then you, I had bands and artists and everybody coming up to me afterwards and saying much of the same thing, and I'm just like, I'm just a guy from Rockford, Illinois that had like that kind of a thing. Yeah. So I, I I struggle with confidence from time to time still. So. Sure. Well, and I think you know, I think I, I think if people were being honest and being vulnerable, to to th- to think that a person is going to be at a constant hundred percent confidence all the time, they're probably not telling the truth because I just don't think that's how it works. I, I think it's confidence is because it, or either that or they're continually to put himself in safe places where they don't have to grow. Right. Because anytime I'm stretched out of my comfort zone, my confidence is going to wane. You know. Well, and I think a lot of, we, we hear this term in the entrepreneurship space right now of imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I battle with imposter syndrome. Sure. sure. Because it's like, okay, I still, I, I haven't made my first million yet. Mm-hmm. I spent way more than I earned. Like I, I've made mistakes. Like mm-hmm. I continue to make mistakes. Like, 
but it's a lot of those mistakes that I go through, that I have gone through, that allow me to mitigate the risks that others take. Right, exactly. And and I think that's that's the whole thing is that it's not about doing something mistake free, because again, it's it's like using baseball as an example. If you have a player that's batting a thousand, that means they've probably only been up to bat a few times, right? Maybe only once, right? And and so that isn't necessarily, um, you know, baseball a great example of, of you know what are we looking at you know a great batting average 400 I mean and that means 40 percent of the time they make contact 40 percent of the time they get on base right 60 percent of the time they don't it's what they learn in those setbacks whether they learning to correct that right, right. you know you uh, as I mentioned to you earlier you know we have this event coming up that is uh, specifically about um, you know with my suicide prevention program for young adults, mm-hmm. which, as you know, um, is at epidemic proportions right now, right? And everywhere, yeah, and in young adults, even even greater than it's been before. With a thirty three percent increase in in deaths by suicide, and um, and and then also, what are those factors that lead to that darkness? Right? Is is what we've been doing with Shatter Our Silence? Well, this particular event is about how to use the platform of sport. And athletics and how to use arts to develop resiliency and transformation and obviously it's been part of your story Mm -hmm. most recently with with working out and and physically transforming your your body and but music and art has been throughout your life and so how do you how do you see the idea of development of resiliency in this in the metaphor now some people make a career out of sport and in the arts but it's also the lessons that we learn in it that we cross over to another part of of living how, how do you how do you see that for yourself and how do you see that possibility for others to resiliency development i mean it here here's the thought on that so we're as a musician or as an artist or as a in the fitness or as an athlete what's the one thing that everybody has to do practice right yep. even in meditation they call it a practice yep in going to therapy it's a practice of uh, of of breaking through your own setbacks mm-hmm. it's constant if you're not living your craft regardless of whether it's athletics, whether it's art, whether it's music, whether it's business, whether it's public speaking, if you're whatever the case may be, it takes practice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You would not have caught me dead five years ago doing video, mm-hmm. let alone appearing on a podcast, mm-hmm. let alone talking on stages across the country yep. and giving a guest lecture at Robert Morris University when I have not even touched college. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't call me dead doing that five years ago. And I know that because I gave my first talk in Rockford four years ago. Mm. I bombed it. (laughs) I bombed it. Ask Pablo. He'll remember. I got up there thinking I was all big and bad and could talk and was... and didn't speak. Mm. And... Well, it's just, it's constant work and evolution. And I mean, and the constant work builds a re- resiliency. Yeah. And I mean, I have too many people around me who focus on what makes them comfortable in relationships, in life, in business. And I'm like, I'm, and I, unfortunately, I've been blessed to live a comfortable life. But it f- it's not forced me to grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ultimately, regardless if it's different forms of art or different forms of sport, the only way for growth to happen is to do fail. the work. Yeah, to do the work, but you're going to fail. You you when you work out, you're running to failure. You're you're training to failure. You're going to try a different idea with this particular sound or this particular lyric and it it may or may not work at first. But that's okay. If it doesn't, then what do we need to craft? What do we need to do right. to come back a different way? 
Yeah. So with the so so part of what you do, right, mm-hmm. is it sounds like you're managing some bands, right, and and other aspects of behind the scenes of uh, re- regarding the music industry and and helping get music out there, get musicians out there, right. Well, and it's not even just music and musicians. It, it's I mean I work with businesses. I do a lot a lot of the same work that I'm doing with musicians transcends just the music industry, and it's about how are you building your organization? Mm -hmm. What are you looking at for the future of your company and how you're wanting to build as an entrepreneur, as as a business leader, as a thought leader? Mm -hmm. So it's not just music industry. Right. And that's the important kind of transcendence that I've made is the work that I do carries no boundaries. There is no, there is no area that it cannot positively affect. Okay. So if you think of like, regardless if it's a, a, a an entrepreneur, right? Someone who's now ventured into giving themselves permission to be what they've probably been all along and, and really put themselves out there as an entrepreneur, or maybe it's an artist, a musician, right? Which are entrepreneurs in their own right. Yep. 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 When they want immediate success, when they when they were told that once well once you cross the threshold, now it's going to be what did someone say earlier rainbows and unicorns. Now, um, when what do you tell them when that when that happens? When they say that, it's going to take ten times longer than you think it will. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm eight years into this thing from the music label perspective. From the entrepreneur perspective, I mean, a couple years in. And this shit's not easy. Mm -hmm. But if it was, if it came to you, just poof. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't respect it as much. Mm -hmm. It would be a painful process. Because then what happens when it all goes away? Mm -hmm. No. So when someone has they they put in what they put in time right they get they get a little they, a door opens for them right? right and and i remember you know i was fortunate enough that when i was 18 i won the teenage mr usa and and and, and i wasn't prepared for that right but it had happened now right. and now i was thrust into a different place um the following year I didn't win another national title in that huh. category. Interesting how that happens. Yeah, and sixth place in the nation felt like failing when you had been had won the overall the year before. Right. Um, it wasn't going to be. It wasn't easy to stay on top. It, it wasn't going to be um, going to come just because I showed up. Um, it, it, there was miscalculations that year, mm-hmm. and in in things that we took, uh, chances that we took, gambles that we took regarding preparation for that particular show. We learned from it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I never won another overall title again before I, re- I stopped competing when I was 22. Um, but the lessons that I learned were invaluable for me later becoming a counselor, later becoming a businessman or an entrepreneur, um, and then now venturing into the different things that I'm doing now. Right. Um, those all go back mm-hmm. to those lessons that I learned in the gym or on the field or, or wherever it might have been. Um, less to do with being on the stage, more to do with the preparation and the discipline and and those those setbacks before and then after right. um, that stage. And this is what it all comes down to. It's not success on my terms for me, for, for you, right? It's not, if I'm, if I'm working with you in your business or you as an artist or you in whatever framework we, we cultivate a working relationship with, it's, I'm not creating success for you on my terms. Right. I'm allowing you to develop success for you on yours. Right. But it's a lot of us. I mean, it's the fear of failure versus the fear of success, right? What do, what what do we choose to fear more? Mm-hmm. I think I think we opt to fear failure more because it's not our perception of failure. It's what oh my god if 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 I fail now, then Kevin's not going to like me anymore. Mm-hmm. Or 
if I, it, it's other people's perception right. of either, right? Yeah. The fear, it, fear of failure or success is fear of others' perception on either of those situations. Right. And if we can get past that, which is tough, mm-hmm. right? Let's let's be honest, it's not easy. But it has the potential to be powerful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, you you said something earlier, and and. And we don't necessarily have to have a, 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 a concrete memory of something for us to have an emotional response to something, right? right. And and you talked about some early experiences in life of, mm-hmm. of, of not perceiving that you were observed not being good enough, and that was your perception. Mm-hmm. And then you discovered a, a genre of music that spoke to you and mm-hmm. energized you and, and gave you some gave you some gave you some identity right it's amazing to me what what you did over this past weekend right you know now you've been practicing the last eight years and maybe more specifically the last couple years in being in this being in that platform that you're in now you could have gotten lost in in the the lights of who you were sitting next to at that table right um or you go all right i just need to be ryan I just need to be Ryan and recognize who's in the audience and what are they going to need. Right. Um, doesn't mean that we don't have at, a, at, a, at an emotional level, right? The the memory of feeling less than, right. Right? intimidated, right? Because mm-hmm. I can be intimidated today. Will bring back the feelings uh, of of an earlier time period. That's the battlefront right. that we have to in those moments and not get distracted or lost in right. that. So I can be present for the audience, for the people I'm sitting next to. Um, and I think it's the, those challenges. And, and this idea, I think you, you make a great point about perception. Um, you know, the, the the easy perception that, you know, this amount of liquids in this bottle mm-hmm. is, is my perception of it half full or half empty, which one's correct? Well, neither are correct. It's a bottle that has liquid in it. four ounces of water in an eight ounce bottle, right? It's it's in what happens with me if I call it half empty, the story that I tell myself, versus if I tell it's half full. How am I utilizing that? How am I biasing, you know, mm-hmm. myself? And it sounds like you know um, being able to uh, be part of something that's trying to revolutionize a, a vested interest in keeping it the same way. Um, which is always the ones we take on, um, because to take on something else, why would you do that? Right. Um, but most importantly, who it's going to serve. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, you're serving artists, musicians, and the general public of what, what they're not being exposed to, right. because it's being contained mm-hmm. um, by some other people. Right. Um, Ryan, if you were going to uh, to whoever's listening, right, and regardless if they're a musician, an artist, getting involved with, you know, wanting to change their life by working out, you know, physical life and mental life, or if it was an entrepreneur, if there was something that you were going to share with them about uh, about following that that thing that won't go away, about it setbacks, never goes away. <laughs> what would you share? <laughs> It's interesting that you phrase it that way because there's something that I've said in in wrapping up of a lot of my own videos and content and podcasts of my own that um, actually carries resonance in this moment, so I'll just share that. Um, Anybody who's followed me or knows my story, it's really about these three things. It's about being happy, right? Finding whatever happiness is to you. The second is having fun because we all life is way too short, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Like I had fun this past weekend. Mm-hmm. I have fun doing a lot of the work that I do. Some of it's going to change, especially as of what I've experienced recently, because it's not been fun. Mm-hmm. And the minute that something stops becoming fun is meaning I'm either not doing it right or I'm not supposed to be doing it at all. Mm-hmm. And... Um, Last but certainly not least is it takes work, Mm -hmm. right? So have fun. No, be happy. Have fun. Work. But keep 
keep in mind, it's finding happiness and having fun that matters first because there's no amount of work on this planet that can bring you either of those two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you make a great point uh, for whatever that thing it is that you want to create, you want to give, mm -hmm. um, you want to help, whatever that may be, to become to become exceptional, to, to, to make a difference, make an impact, it's going to take risk, but it's also going to take work at that risk. And, right. and it's going to take taking a risk of failure, experiencing failure, learning from that failure, mm -hmm. taking risk not to try to avoid the failure. Right. I, I don't like failing as much as anybody, but what things could I put in place that I've learned from other things to minimize that? But if I do have setbacks, it's not the end of the world. It's... It, it's what can I learn from those now, right? You know, and then improve on that process and improve on and, and doing it next time. Um, but this idea that if we're in that flow of, of who and what we're supposed to do, um, that's when I experience that fun. Right. Now, don't get me wrong. I love listening to comedians. I love spending time with my family, and we're just laughing and having that, and that's fun as well. But being in that flow. Right. Knowing that I'm working at doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. Um, now that's fun. Yeah. Yeah. And then last but certainly not least, it's really, 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 truly important to take time to breathe. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And it's one of those. It's one of those things too, where even if you just say the word breathe once a day, mm -hmm. it's kind of weird. It actually forces you to do the action mm -hmm. of actually breathing yeah. when you say the word breathe. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because of something you said earlier about, you know, when we're in that 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 uh, position, right, where we're out of our comfort zone, a natural human response to that is adrenaline because of its threatening, fight or flight. Right. The antidote to that first starts with breathing. Mm -hmm. If we can breathe and get some oxygen to our brain, we may have a better, better opportunity to lower some of that adrenaline, at least to a manageable level, so that we just need enough of it to get through the task, right. not more than that. So I think your your idea of just breathing and and being able to take a deep breath in, slow down, so you can see where you need to go next, right. um, is another good another good point. Ryan, thank you. Very very much for uh, being here today Thanks, and, and being able to share. Um, if people wanted to get a hold of you, wanted to follow you, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Uh, Instagram. Uh, Instagram is kind of the link to everything for me okay. right now. Uh, plus, it's kind of got the platform that has all of my other links and all of my other platforms. Okay. Uh, but Instagram is at Philip Ryan Block. That's two L's in Philip. Um, on there, I mean, my cell phone number is attached to my Instagram profile, so it'll literally ring that device sitting over there no and which will then subsequently ring this device sitting right here um yeah instagram is the best uh but i'm everywhere okay. so perfect well ryan once again thank you for being here thanks, and uh thanks for sharing your story but also about the journey that you're on right now so thank appreciate you, that ryan. thank you um thank you very much for being with us today as you as you heard uh, ryan share his story um not only about uh some of the things in his background that led to this but his love for not only art but then finding that place and his love for music and then most importantly how could he impact the industry um, through musicians and through individuals that also have an appreciation for music as well. Um, thank you very much for being with us today and I look forward to being with you next week.